as we go deeper into learning, uh, can technology uh, accelerate and, and deepen the quality of learning? And in fact, the answer is yes, although not automatically yes, and that's what we're sorting out. We have these uh, six C's, they're called, that will be familiar to most people. Uh, critical thinking, communication, creativity, collaboration, character education, and citizenship. How does technology uh, relate to those? I'm going to call those six uh, the deep learning goals. And it turns out that if you purposely use technology, it can go a long way to accelerate it. So we have certain criteria. How does the learning become irresistibly engaging? Students want it uh, and teachers want it. Uh, how, does it, how does it get used without getting too complicated technically? It's the second one. Uh, how do you use technology 24-7 so you're accessing the information purposefully all around the clock? And then also how do you do work that's steeped in what we call real life problem solving? The foundation for this incident, incidentally is this dynamic relationship between uh, push and pull. So push is the finding, I won't give you all the research, but it's very clear that as students move up the grades from kindergarten onward, they, uh, they are increasingly bored almost everywhere. And so that's, uh, and teachers are somewhat alienated because it's hard to teach the board. So that get, that's the push factor. It's psychologically pushing people out. The pull factor is the tremendous digital world that's got all kinds of ever increasing attractions. Uh, not all of which is productive, but it is a pull. And so what we're trying to do is say, first of all, this pull, push-pull dynamic is going to cause an explosion. Something's got to give. So let's be there in, as part of the explosion and uh, see how technology can uh, increase the learning. Technology is now so attractive, so seductive, so available, so sophisticated, so uh, kind of uh, pervasive in both in its presence and what it can access that you just, uh, everybody sort of grows up on that. And then it's a question of how do we how do we not get overwhelmed by it? Uh, we, we have a phrase, when something is that powerful, you want to figure out how to move towards the danger and figure out how to get it on your terms, where you can't hide from it or you can't try, but then worse things will happen. We also see in the school districts, uh, they're appointing, uh, they're called CIOs, Chief Information Officers. And these CIOs, they typically are 35 to 45 years of age. Uh, they've grown up on technology, and they're, uh, unlike the old technology people, uh, these people are interested in learning, the, the learning phenomenon. So everything is conspiring in the right way now that is getting used. And I guess ultimately I would say maybe schools 50 years from now won't exist the way we know them now. But for right now, that's where the students are. And you can expand the day, and you can make dynamic during that. You can cover a lot of ground with a lot of students, and that's what's happening right now. The state of Florida has mandated uh, every student, 100% of students in high school, have to take at least one online course. That's 100% for one course. You could just multiply that, and you can see where that could go. So uh, it's the same phenomenon for high schools, uh, but it's also the same problem. How do we, how do we assess quality? and how do we know it's being learned and what are the conditions under which uh, uh, these things can actually flourish. So there's a lot of quality issues, but this is about that kind of phenomenon. I prefer it to happen that way. Go gangbusters, get it all out there, uh, let, it, let it bubble up and let the quality pieces then get sorted out afterwards rather than be cautious at the, cautious at the beginning. What you see in these schools that are uh, using technology in the service of learning is that they are really, um, uh, students are working in groups with each other w around their machines and accessing them. And the teacher is orchestrating, we call the teacher as change agent, the student as partner in learning. So you get advantage of uh, learning from your fellow students, learning from the teacher. The teacher's, teacher is orchestrating this and really making it come alive. Uh, and then on top of that, because of the accessibility 24-7. Uh, think of it this way, uh, you spend four or five hours in the school doing this engaging learning, but then uh, those students that are turned on, lots of them in this way, they start to uh, do additional three, four hours after that, so all of a sudden you've got double the learning time uh, at no extra, price, no extra cost. It's really quite powerful, obviously, just by, by definition. Take the flipped classroom, what it normally means is that the teacher, um, either with his or her own video, uh, doing, which is easy to do now uh, by oneself, uh, or, or the use of other videos, had students uh, uh, purposefully review video in the, uh, in the after hours and do a lot of the learning that way. And then the, uh, in the classroom, the time is taken up to discuss the meaning and to go deeper. 
So it's almost like flipping it where the instruction looks like it's happening at night without the teacher and that the discussion, which uh, maybe would have been homework before, is, uh, is the day. We call a teacher as change agent, teacher as activator. A teacher who can um, kind of identify the best possible things, uh, figure out where student, uh, individual students' interests are, begin to help them find their niche, uh, leverage the learning, and to know whether or not the learning is uh, occurring. As one of our experts said, a great teacher should be on any given day, be able to uh, give defensible evidence about what their students are doing and what their students are learning, what the aim is, and how far they're getting. So there's a lot for in what we call the new pedagogy. Uh, but it has to be now sorted out and then we it's more complicated because the, in the new work there's really a fundamental learning partnership not only between a teacher and a student but among students and among teachers so it's a, more of a collectivity it's more complicated but that's where the power is these deep learning goals that I've talked about they're really um, entrepreneurial skills. I'm still sticking with the students when I say that. By entrepreneurial skills, uh, to me entrepreneurial skills means you can do do things, you can design, you can accomplish things. And normally we think of entrepreneur as business, but social entrepreneurialism, as uh, many people know, is about how do you improve the community? Uh, how do you improve sustainability? What about uh, the plight of old people? What about bullying? All of those things re uh, for good solutions require social entrepreneurial mindset and skills and, and work. So it fits really uh, strongly into that part and it's very active. It's the doing. It's what young people like to do. They want to, uh, you know, they don't want to say, uh, be told, well, this will be relevant when you grow up. They want to say, how can I use it now? What, what good is it? And that's a beautiful, uh, I think, pressure point. How is technology changing your world? Join the conversation at tvo.org slash poll. Thank you.